This is HRS TV, and I'm Eliani Mejia, uh, and I have the pleasure today to have Dr. Christopher Leo with us, uh, and he is uh, sharing with us today an important statement from HRS, that is the a statement on catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Leo. It's a pleasure to have you with us, so welcome to this platform that is also yours. Thank you, Dr. Mejia uh, Eliani, if I may. Eliane is <laughs> So this is an important statement that we were all, all waiting for. Actually, with the expanded indication for atrial fibrillation ablation, I think that it was very needed to set some standards and to have uh, uh, the HRS, that is um, our society, uh, to address these issues and actually to, to say what is needed, what is important, and what are the requirements. So I just want to uh, talk in general. What are the primary issues addressed by this position statement? Absolutely, Eliani. Uh, exactly as you hit it on the head. Uh, so, of course, as the latest guidelines and expert consensus documents were released in the past one to two years, really indicating that AFib ablation is increasingly done for expanded indications, a wider spectrum of patients. And of course, very importantly, with evolving technology that has allowed us to do these ablation procedures more efficiently and more effectively we decided from the Heart Rhythm Health Policy and Regulatory Affairs side, uh, the committee, uh, that it was time to uh, craft and distribute a relatively simple document that really reaffirms some of the important principles that have already been laid out through all of our training, all of our experience, and these latest uh, guideline and, cons uh, and consensus documents. And specifically, you know, that uh, when we are doing an ablation procedure, it is not just anatomical ablation, it is the very electrophysiologic endpoints that we're trying to do and gather in order to make the procedures as optimally effective for each patient as possible, instead of just achieving the fastest ablation possible, which um, I think has been a narrative that we have seen more and more so in recent years. So I want to highlight exactly what you just said. So we are just pretty much uh, setting what is mean an atrial fibrillation ablation. It's like pulmonary vein isolation. Not only the circumferential ablation, it's just that you want to make sure and emphasize that we all talk the same language. So what we mean by this is that we have to confirm uh, that patients have actually bidirectional block entry and exit block. So that's what we all are on the same page on this, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Again, yes, <clears throat> this has been talked about and is the endpoint for what we have been doing for the past 20 years in okay. AFib ablation. Um, but it was important to specifically detail that because, you know, as with anything that happens in life, you know, with time, people take certain things for granted. And so we wanted to reaffirm what does it mean to isolate the pulmonary veins? It means that we have to check for entrance and exit block, that the pulmonary veins are electrically silent. That's what we're aiming for with the circumferential ablation. So that when we do circumferential ablation, that is necessary, but it is not sufficient. What we need to demonstrate after that ablation is that the pulmonary veins are actually electrically disconnected from the rest of the atrium. And if that was not achieved, then more ablation needs to be done to make sure that is achieved. That's actually uh, sounds simple, but it's very important to understand the, the principles of electrophysiology regarding atrial fibrillation with the growing technology that actually moving faster, right? Moving faster, more anatomy. Uh, and, and another point that I think that is what's very important is actually emphasizing the importance of induction protocols to look for other sources, to look for other non-pulmonary triggers, to look for any other associated uh, perhaps flutters or uh, AVNRT. So not forgetting uh, the inductions protocol at the end. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. Again, for any electrophysiologist who is familiar with reading AFib ablation literature, we know that every method section for these papers includes after the pulmonary vein isolation is done, 
program stimulation is performed to assess for non-pulmonary vein triggers and other associated arrhythmias. Well, what does that mean? That means that we have to do the program stimulation. And why is it important? Because these non-pulmonary vein triggers, these additional arrhythmia mechanisms can be the source of recurrent arrhythmias. And if a patient has an AFib ablation, comes back with supraventricular tachycardia, atrial flutter, and other arrhythmias, then we have to be looking at doing a repeat ablation procedure. And so in order to maximize the one-time ablation efficacy, we need to uh, look for and be ready to map and ablate additional arrhythmia mechanisms. If we, uh, Eliane, just look at the ADVENT study for pulmonary uh, for pulsed field ablation, about a quarter of the patients in each arm, the radio frequency or the thermal ablation and the pulse field ablation arms, about a quarter in each arm had atrial flutter either okay. in their history or found during the ablation procedure and needed additional treatment for that atrial flutter. So if those patients were not treated for their atrial flutter, they could have been the recurrent arrhythmias that then required a, a, a repeat ablation procedure. I think that that's very important to highlight. And, and actually, so we all speak the same language and we don't forget the core foundation of electrophysiology, right? And what it means, not only the anatomy, but also the physiology part that is actually what we all fell in love for, right? Uh, so why uh, did HR think that it was important to take this position and why now? Well, you know, um, in the ablation realm, we've always, of course, uh, you know, been dealing with both the electrophysiology principles and then the technical aspects of actually rendering the ablation treatment. And so over the past 15 to 20 years, we have, thanks to all the scientists, our clinicians, industry partners, we've had progressive improvements in technology that has allowed us to deliver the ablation more and more efficiently and more and more effectively, and in fact, more safely as well. And so uh, as, as part of that, we wanted to appreciate it, okay? But at the same time, we cannot forget that our foundational principles of electrophysiology are critical to what makes these ablation procedures a complete uh, procedure. And so we wanted to re-emphasize at this time of rapid technology evolution as we start to take on pulse field ablation for more ablation procedures that we do not forget the electrophysiologic endpoints that need to be done. And importantly, in those of us who do the procedure, in those of us who are training to do this procedure, and in those of us who are thinking about doing this ablation in years to come, that we understand the importance of training and maintaining our skill sets in electrophysiology principles, in mapping, and in ablation of complex arrhythmia circuits, besides the anatomical ablation that is rendered for AFib. That is very important. And actually, I want to uh, highlight that point, because HRS is what we call our mother institution for all. And HRS set the standards, not only for the U.S., but also internationally. And as this field grows and grows, it's important for us to speak the same language. When we say we do this, so we know what that actually means and what that entails. Uh, I like what you mentioned about uh, the credentials, right? Um, uh, the training of an, an electrophysiology, not only in the U.S., but also abroad. And to maintain those credentials and how important it is for that and for the success of electrophysiology worldwide. What do you mean by uh, uh, EP training? I just want for the whole community. This is not only for the U.S. This is only for the rest of the world, okay? Uh, what are the requirements for EP training? Just briefly, can you just... Talk about that. Sure. I think those of us who have been through electrophysiology training know it when we see it, right? And so what are the basic electrophysiology principles? That is, we are able to place electrode catheters. We know what it means to use a stimulator to do program stimulation, to pace the different parts of the heart, atria, ventricles, to assess for the presence of accessory pathways, dual AV nodal physiology, refractory periods, 
single, double, triple, burst pacing, extra stimuli, and burst pacing stimulation in order to induce arrhythmias. And once arrhythmias are induced, to be able to do maneuvers, to understand the mechanisms of the arrhythmia, to understand principles of uh, simple and 3D mapping to localize the circuit and the location for where arrhythmias can be targeted for ablation. So this, of course, is much easier said than done. This in the United States currently involves a two-year advanced electrophysiology fellowship training program. Of course, in localities around the world, the training can take on different forms. But again, those of us who do electrophysiology know electrophysiology training when we see it, yeah. and it needs to be a formal process. This is not something that's going to be acquired over a weekend or over a one to two weeks of training. This takes experience. Yeah. Why is this important? Well, anyone can argue, well, uh, you know, we could just put in a, a pulse field catheter on the pulmonary veins and step on the pedal a few times, right? But what's going to happen if you have not successfully isolated that pulmonary vein? You have to be ready to map the gap and, and determine where to do additional ablation in order to achieve isolation of that pulmonary vein. Yep. And what would happen if you happen to uh, move the catheter around and induce an atrial flutter or some other supraventricular tachycardia. You have to be prepared to manage that situation, to be able to map the arrhythmia and to address the arrhythmia. Yeah. This cannot be, well, somebody just goes in to do an afib ablation and then if some other arrhythmia comes up, well, we just stop the procedure and call it a day. No, this is not the right thing for the patients. They are under uh, the effects of the procedure, and they are expecting and need a comprehensive procedure to fully address all of their arrhythmia mechanisms. And so this is why it is important for every person who is doing any AFib ablation to be prepared for all the possible electrophysiologic scenarios that could come up during an AFib ablation procedure. And that's not even to say that the treatment for AFib and the entire understanding of the pathophysiologic mechanisms of AFib are critical to understand which ablation techniques are right for which patient. Yeah. As you might know, as you know, I'm sure, Eliani, besides mm -hmm. pulmonary vein isolation, there are other techniques to treat atrial fibrillation, including substrate-based ablation, including linear ablation, including uh, ganglionated plexi and other uh, areas to treat for complex atrial fibrillation. Well, when is it the right thing to do any of these things for any one patient? This is a complex decision-making process that takes into account many of the patient factors and also the physician's uh, experience in treating these scenarios. And so this is really not a fair situation to put someone who is not an experienced electrophysiologist into a situation where they treat a complex arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation. Chris, I couldn't agree more with you, okay? And this is a so important statement from the HRS and actually setting the standards, not only for the US, you know, for the rest of the world. We all care about EP. We all want it for this technology to work, but we have to use it. We have to use it the right way, understanding the complexity that it comes with it. Uh, and this is important. This is important to say what is needed to be done and what are the expectations from us as an EP physicians, not only in the U.S., but also in the rest of the world. This is a very important statement. Sounds simple, but it's extremely important for, for us to measure everything on the same way. So what type of reactions are you getting from the HRS members, not only in the U.S., but also from different parts of the world? Well, Eliani, the, um, the statement was just released last week. And um, so, you know, certainly on social media, and among HRS members and other electrophysiologists I've uh, uh, run into and uh, spoken with, the response has really been so far overwhelmingly positive. This is a scenario where it really is the, excuse me, the silent majority. All the people who are following the news of people and, uh, you know, uh, cases posting, well, you know, it took me such a little time to do an AFib ablation. 
And I think this statement and the timing of it really is to give the silent majority a voice to say, you know what, <clears throat> it's okay to take a little bit longer and make sure we do a thorough job for the patients. And in fact, the overwhelming majority of our community as electrophysiology clinicians is to do a thorough and quality job for the patients. It doesn't have to be the fastest job possible. I think that that's perfect. This is actually what we all wanted to have a voice and to have a statement from the HRS and to set a standards. What is actually is to do things right, not only anatomically speaking, but also remember the core and the essentials of electrophysiology. So thank you so much, Chris, for having this time with us at HRS TV. Uh, and thank you for being a voice for all of us and just to set the standards, to put in the bar for all of us EP, not only in the US, but also in the rest of the world. Anything else that you wanna say for the EP community around the world, for else? Really, Eliani, that, um, you know, as I've said before, I think we um, should be so appreciative and so thankful that we work in this field where the number of us who do this are able to make such a big difference for our patients and uh, that we get to work with intelligent and hardworking and caring individuals like yourself and all of our colleagues in electrophysiology. And we need to appreciate it. At the same time, we need to have our priorities in the right place so that we can continue to pursue what is the right thing for our patients and that is ultimately going to lead to success for all of us in the field. Definitely patient-centered care. The patient is the center. So thank you so much, Chris, for being with us. And this is HRS TV. And uh, if you want to comment or have a conversation, just write on the link below and you will have the HRS policy statement so you can review it. See you next time. Bye.